that it can be done and the impact that it can have in the long run. Now I'll go ahead and take the names of the speakers that are to be in this session on the front row. That will be Mr. Naresh Duble, DGM Training and FMD Armstrong, Colonel D, uh, D, Dr. K. S. Sahani, that is Principal St. Kabir School, Hisar, Uttara Singh, Principal the Sri Ram Millennium School, Noida, Rachna Pant, Principal Ramja School, R.K. Puram, New Delhi, Vikesh uh, Beniwal, Director, Bansi Vidyalay Niketan, Senior Secondary School, Ballabgarh, J. Ajit Prasad, Jain, Senior Principal, Bharti Vidya Bhavan, Raja Ji Vidya Ashram, Chennai, Anita Vadera, that is Principal, Darabari Lal, DAV, Model School, New Delhi, Kavita C. Das, Principal St. Joseph High School, Chandigarh, Farzana Shakil Ali, Principal City International School, Lucknow, Indu Khetrapal, Principal Salman Public School, New Delhi, Anirudh Gupta, CEO, DCM Group of School, Firozpur, Jeenan Aibara, Principal Ambient School, New Delhi, Jaya Bhadwaj, Principal Hansraj Public School, Panchkula, Ramjit Guman, Principal in this world school, Ludhiana. Rama Dutt, that is Principal Sanskar School, Jaipur. Anuradha Gupta, Principal the Sri Ram Millennium School, Faridabad. Yaseem Contractor, Principal Summerfield School, Gurgaon. Ritu Gupta, Principal Indrapras Global School, Noida. Raj Kumar Sharma, Principal Satyuk Darshan Vidyale, Greater Faridabad. J.C. Chawla, Principal Dayawati Modi Public School, Ghaziabad. R.S. Panwar, Principal MDN Public School, Rothak. Dr. Neera Sharma, Principal DAV Public School, Amritsar. Yudhir Singh, Director, Goyla Progressive Public School, Palwal. Willie Broad, uh, George Principal St. Willie Broad High School, Mumbai. Dr. Satyabrata Minikten, Principal ODM Public School, Bhugneshwar. Jayashri M. Tripathi, International Educator and Advisor, Global Education Program. Shika Banerjee, Principal Said Andran, Jaipuriya School, Kanpur. So there are a lot of names that I've read. I'm not sure how many of you are here right now because there's some of them who are joined a little later. So we'll be starting a session. William, uh, you can please take over the session now. Great, thank you very much. Uh, is my color mic working? Great, okay, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, I'd just like to start very simply by uh, telling you how I got here, really. Um, this morning, I mentioned the school that I attended um, and the fact that my nieces both attended the same school. Uh, that was way back in the 1970s. I, I then went to the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, uh, where I studied modern languages and graduated in 1980. And immediately after that, I, I went into school teaching, and I taught for two years in the United Kingdom, teaching English. Um, then I decided that I didn't want to remain in the UK for the rest of my life, and I started a, a certificate in teaching English as a foreign language. Uh, immediately after that, I went to Saudi Arabia, and I stayed in Saudi Arabia for seven years working first of all in the primary section of an international school for Arab children. And that really was a case of jumping in at the deep end. I had had very little preparation for uh, that experience. Uh, so I think that experience as a whole was for me personally extremely innovative. And looking back, I can see that I received some fairly good support <coughs> from my school principal at the time. But that was in the old days, that was in the 1980s. I, I then joined the British Council, uh, where I worked for 15 years, four of which were spent in Pakistan as the manager of the British Council's examinations business. And um, during that time, I became very familiar with Cambridge examinations. I then left the British Council and joined Cambridge International Examinations, which, as you may know, is uh, one of the providers of international programs and qualifications. Operating globally, 
very much operating here in India, where I work with a small but perfectly formed team. I think they are both sitting in the room. Rakesh, I can see you there. Vinayak, is he in the room? Yeah, thank you. Vinayak Sudhakar and Rakesh Konjingban. So we're, we're part of the Cambridge team supporting international schools, and indeed I can see a few principals here who are using Cambridge programs. Uh, we offer four programs, but I'm not going to tell you about them now because time is short, and this is uh, not the right place for me to start talking about Cambridge in detail. This is going to be an interactive session, uh, but before we actually get underway, I'd like to invite Mr. Naresh Duble from Armstrong, who will be talking to you for 15 minutes. Um, uh, I think he will introduce himself and the topic of his presentation, which is about acoustic learning. Myself, my name is Naresh Dubre, and I really thank you for the gift of your time and attention. Next 15 minutes, I'm going to speak about acoustics in education. Armstrong as a company globally present. We are 152-year-old company uh, working across the globe, partnering very strongly with Education Institute in developed nations. In India, uh, we are there for the last 20 years, but our focus has been ITBPO last one year. I'm, I'm very privileged to work into education sector, and I travel across India, uh, visiting higher education, K-12 education, primary education, and I feel very good uh, to stand here and to share with you that there is a lot of work, a lot of difference we can make into education system just by having proper classrooms. So my presentation is going to be about, not about my product so much, but it's about how sound impact learning. There are some research papers which we have, and we have 500 scientists back in US working around acoustics all along, so I got a lot of support from them in terms of some papers which I can share with you how kids learn. So, uh, so I've, I'm very sure you'll find this session interesting and useful, and end of it, we can see how we can fix the problem, if at all you think you have a problem. And we have a team across India in 26 locations uh, where you can, we can come and do audit uh, acoustical audit in your classroom so that we get a better efficiency with the same teacher and the same student. So that's the that's something which I'm going to speak to you. And I find you will you'll find it very useful. Yeah. So I'm going to speak about something very common sense, and we all know the common sense is most com uncommonly used in business. So school of our students, this is what we said and we discussed in the last session also, uh, acoustical solution for leaders of tomorrow. We're talking about innovation and leadership. The creative man is motivated by desire to achieve, not by desire to beat others. And success and leadership is all about being better your former self than to worry about anybody else. And that's the definition we talk about innovation. So small improvement done over time lead to stunning results. And we all know that and we all teach about this. But this is a situation what we have in our school. So as a principal, as an owner of a school, how many times or how many occasions in a day your kids tell you that I can't understand you? Or how many times you don't understand what kids are saying in a room? And this is a very normal situation in Indian school uh, industry. For that not to happen, or rather to have a very successful school, we need to have an intelligibility of the sound. Now what it means is you understand what I'm saying and I understand what you are saying in a given space. For that, we need to have a proper design of the school and a proper treatment to be done. In our current education systems, it's not sufficient for someone to sit in the class and just attend the classes. You need to understand, assimilate, and reproduce in the exam to prove that he is good or school is good. So we, we need to be really mindful about whether we have a sound clarity 
in our classrooms. And once we achieve a sound clarity, we need to protect that sound clarity from mechanical noise. Now, noise is anything else than teachers or a student noise in the classroom. A fan noise, maybe an air conditioning noise, a street noise, a, a noise coming from an atrium in own school, a neighboring school sound, all is noise which distract the learning in the classroom. So this is a snapshot of Indian indu uh, education industry. We are going across India and actually taking an audit, seeing how much is the background noise and how much is the reverberation time. Now, background noise is easily measured. You have a smartphone. You can have an app downloaded called Sound Meter, and you can go to your school tomorrow morning and see what is the background noise you're, you are teaching in. And we will see the implication of background noise in learning. Reverberation time is a little technical. Uh, we learn it in all physics, but it's, it's, a sound, it's a time required for sound to die by 60, deci uh, 60 decibel. You and me, as a human being, without an answer, can speak at 80 decibel, 75, shouting. 120 bomb blast. So even the, this speaker is like 90 decibel, 95 decibel. 10 decibel more is double, double the sound. That's acoustics. So as a human being, we have a limitation to speak beyond 70, 75 decibel. Now, if you have a school which has a background noise of 50, 55 decibel, you know what happened with the teacher's voice. And we all are a victim of it in a way. So uh, I have a small uh, TED talk. Uh, now, TED is a platform we all know where the best in the world come and share their knowledge. And this is the TED talk about acoustics. I'm not going to play the entire TED talk. I'm just playing a clipping which is pertaining to education and acoustics uh, in, in, in education. And uh, Julian Trejer is a scientist from UK. And he's going to speak about sorry for this mess up. Yeah, Ted cut. Yeah. So this is a clipping from the Ted talk and sound here, please. Classroom that looks like this. Can you imagine how this sounds? I enforce education. So he's going to talk about uh, education classrooms and impact of it. He just covers in the next three minutes. When I see a classroom that looks like this, can you imagine how this sounds? I am forced to ask myself a question. <laughs> now, that's a little unfair. Some of my best friends are architects, and they definitely do have ears, but I think sometimes they don't use them when they're designing buildings. Here's a case in point. This is a 32 million pound flagship academy school, which was built quite recently in the UK and designed by one of Britain's top architects. Unfortunately, it was designed like a corporate headquarters with a vast central atrium and classrooms leading off it with no back walls at all. The children couldn't hear their teachers. They had to go back in and spend £600,000 putting the walls in. Let's stop this madness of open plan classrooms right now, please. It's not just these modern buildings which suffer. Old-fashioned classrooms suffer too. A study in Florida just a few years ago found that if you're sitting where this photograph was taken in the classroom, row four, speech intelligibility is just 50%. Children are losing one word in two. Now, that doesn't mean they only get half their education, but it does mean they have to work very hard to join the dots and understand what's going on. This is affected massively by reverberation time, how reverberant a room is. In a classroom with a reverberation time of 1.2 seconds, which is pretty common, this is what it sounds like. In language, infinitely many words can be written with a small set of letters. In arithmetic, infinitely many numbers can be composed in just a few digits with the help of the symbol zero. Not so good, is it? If you take that 1.2 seconds down to 0.4 seconds by installing acoustic treatments, sound absorbing materials, and so forth, this is what you get. In language, Infinitely many words can be written with a small set of letters. In arithmetic, infinitely many numbers can be composed from just a few digits with the help of the symbol zero. What a difference. Now that education you would receive, and thanks to the British acoustician Adrian James for those simulations, the signal was the same, the background noise was the same, all that changed was the acoustics of the classroom in those two examples. If education can be likened to watering a garden, which is think oh, it's a fair metaphor, sadly, much of the water is evaporating before it reaches the flowers, especially for some groups. For example, those with hearing impairment. Now, that's not just deaf children. 
That could be any child who's got a cold, glue ear, an ear infection, even hay fever. On a given day, one in eight children fall into that group on any given day. Then you have children for whom English is a second language, or whatever they're being taught in is a second language. In the UK, that's more than 10% of the school population. And finally, after Susan Cain's wonderful TED talk in February, we know that introverts find it very difficult to relate when they're in a noisy environment doing group work. Add those up, that is a lot of children who are not receiving their education properly. It's not just the children who are affected, though. This study in Germany found the average noise level in classrooms is 65 decibels. I have to really raise my voice to talk over 65 decibels of sound. And teachers are not just raising their voices. This chart maps the teacher's heart rate against the noise level. Noise goes up, heart rate goes up. That is not good for you. In fact, 65 decibels is the very level at which this big survey of all the evidence on noise and health found that that is the threshold for the danger of myocardial infarction. To you and me, that's a heart attack. It may not be pushing the boat out too far to suggest that many teachers are losing significant life expectancy by teaching in environments like education. When I see a classroom that looks like this, can you imagine how this sounds? I'm forced to ask myself a question. So my next question is, uh, yeah, go back to this. Who is at more risk in the school? You know? <laughs> yeah, teacher, but uh, the students are giving time of their life. Now, we have an Indian education system where topper sits in first two rows. And even mother tells his kid, please grab those seats, a golden seat. If you sit in a back bench, you're going to be a back bencher. Now, are we not <coughs> refusing education to half of the kids in the school ongoingly, class after class? Schools, kids are not effective listeners. They are like Tarej Aminpur. You know, we have this famous movie. So any external stimulus, any thing which, which attracts them more, they will go into their own journey, and they will get diverted from the core topic. So we need to have a responsibility to maintain a clarity of the sound in the space which we teach in. As you said, the 20% of the students are not in the best form because of the ENT infections and stuff like that. A new event of iPod and mobile phone also giving some permanent hearing loss to the kids. So we need to have more acoustically attuned rooms if we need to teach the students and need to learn from them, whichever way you do it. Uh, English second language, big problem. You know? And if you have an acoustically improper room, even book will sound like bark, book, bark. Forget about technical words and scientific words. And hence, the languages is always suffered in Indian education. We have produced great engineers and good scientists because those are the subjects which are taught on the board. The communication happened primarily in, in, in sign and in written communication. The verbal communication, even IITs and IIM students are not so great in presentations. <coughs> we all know that. So we as an adult, if we go into the classroom and sit on the last bench, we may not find the class so bad because of the graph out here down there which it talks about how kids listen. Our hearing instrument get developed as we grow. If you are six year old, if the background noise is one decibel more than the source of the sound, you hear nothing. And as you grow, 15, 15, 16 years, you can get better at listening even a 5 dB background noise or 6 dB background noise. So this graph, a study done by Acoustic Society for Education, talks about if Articulation index, which is objective measure of the clarity of the sound in the space, is 0.8. Uh, adult can get 100% word. The young one will miss 10%. But what we have in our system is around 0.6 or 0.4, where 20 to 50% words spoken in the class are missed by the good part of the students. So uh, this is a case study which I want to really show it to you, which is uh, a school which is extremely successful school, but it has hard ceiling, hard wall, hard floor. And reverberation time in the space is 1.3 to 1 second. Uh, our hearing instrument, if we get sound coming back to us, after 0.5 seconds, we can hear it distinctly. So uh, acoustical norms across the globe for schools is 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. In different countries, we have none. Uh, we're going to work. We are working with NUPA. And the first paper is going to get out from NUPA on acoustical guidelines. And, and uh, Griha has released Prakruti rating for school system, which talks about background noise only. We don't talk about reverberation time. But reverberation time has a huge impact in the way we teach and way we learn in the school. So we got it down to 0.6 seconds. And uh, this is a feedback, a very short video of a teacher. She's talking about what she felt 
after the treatment is done teaching in the same class. Started out with my usual tone, which is loud because I'm hearing a lot of extraneous sounds, pencils, paper, windows, um, and I did not hear that today. It was, it was great. I was just hearing their voices. And I also noticed that I could hear them better. They were talking softly today. I could hear them better. Usually I get some hesitation after I ask a question. And I find myself repeating the question. Or did everyone hear the question? I get a lot of no's. Today I found that I was able to do more teaching in the same amount of time. I felt like I was closer to my children today and they were closer to me instead of always reaching and straining. Overall, the kids seemed more interested, and I think it's because they didn't have to focus on me telling them that I can't hear you, or their classmates telling them they couldn't hear them. And then I think it just was less of a distraction. So what she said was extremely profound, uh, that she could do more teaching in the same amount of time, and uh, she felt connected. We all know when we teach in the class, when we are connected with our audience, or we are connected with our students, uh, it draws the best in the teacher. And there is a flow to the entire uh, teaching. So, and students also get engaged and get interested. When you have interaction coming in, even you know, kids asking each other what to write and things like that, that, that disturb the space and the flow of the conversation which is happening in the class. And so what makes a great school a great school? Yes, education. Yes, all those other philosophies which are talking in other sessions, but we need to have a basic parameter of connection between a teacher and a student, which is the heart of learning in that space. So it impacts every hour, every second, every minute of education learning happening in your classroom. So what we want is a direct sound from teacher to the student going directly. We, we are okay with early reflection. The hard surface behind teacher is great. Two minutes. Yeah. Uh, what we don't want is a late reflection and echo, and that is done just by managing size, shape, and surface treatment. These are the three parameters we have, and that's physics, that's like gravity, you know, it doesn't change. So the most economical way of doing it is to put a ceiling which is absorbing material on the ceiling because that's omnipresent, uh, which have another benefit also. Other way is if it's a large enough, then you put treat walls. If you, it is a further large, then you have some elements like this coming in, which can distract the sound path. And last one is to maintain, do carpet, which is difficult to maintain. And once we do that, once we have a reverberation time less than 0.5 seconds in the classroom, we need to be mindful where our windows are, where our ACs are, where the sounds are coming in. So barricade all the noise which coming into learning place. Even the fan should be good one, not making good, good, good kind of noise. So other thing is ceiling provide protection from impact isolation, the movement above the floor, is not getting transferred into learning place. The wall STC, sound transmission coefficient, need to be checked and maintained. The global standard is 35 dB for background noise, which is very stringent for Indian standards, what I feel. Uh, we can work around 45, that's what GRIA and we and GRIA has put into the Prakruti rating system for existing school. 45 dB is a good noise because you have a choice to modulate your voice. If you have a 55 dB, you are only shouting. And then the teacher and a student relationship is hostage because he is talking to somebody who is shouting at 75 dB. That's one thing. Second thing, language, I can say I love you in 10 different ways. And each I love you means different thing, depending upon how I say it. But when you have a high background noise, teacher speaking at 70 decibel or 65 or 75 decibel, you cannot modulate the voice. So language, communication, learning is completely impaired because of improper environment in which we are teaching. So with the same level, same quality of teachers and the same quality of students, India can produce far better results immediately if we just became mindful about in the space which we are teaching in. So this is a small brief about Armstrong which I already told about. We are very responsible manufacturer globally present for 150 years. The lobby area need a different treatment than, than, the, than the room areas and lobby is a, a common culprit of problem because anybody talking in a lobby can distract 10 classes uh, in, in the same room. So we need to really absorb sound there and then. We cannot really stop movement in the lobby. So we need to pay attention to that. Uh, the, the ceiling systems also enhances the fire safety of the building. You get better light reflectivity. You get a class 0, class 1, BS 476, one hour of fire rating. Uh, your library need to be treated differently than your, uh, than your lecture room and a teacher area need a different treatment. How can we have the same wall, same ceiling and the same floor and expect to get a different acoustical behavior and a privacy and a concentration in a library and a teacher room 
and in a classroom. So we are really not paying attention to this. This is like a blind spot in Indian education systems currently. And uh, we have some innovative solutions coming in this, this way. So this is a uh, lecture hall. We have some solutions for wall treatment. And our teams are there across India. Uh, we will be sharing our contact. We can come and do audit in your thing. We can recommend what need to be done. And then you can take a choice of you know, choosing it and doing this way. So we have some wall <laughs> solutions where auditorium can be treated. And auditorium and uh, lecture hall is always treated because the reverberation time is 2.53 seconds kind of thing. But what we live with in most of the school, 99% of the school is one reverberation time where we saw all those problems are possible. So I want to sum up saying, you know, we work to inspire the great places what we have. But this is a time to get into a innovation in terms of making sure when we go back, we listen to our places more intuitively. We, we work with you know, designers and authorities in the school so that we make our place fit for the purpose, which impact quality of our life, our health and well-being, our social behavior, and our productivity. Thank you so much. Thanks for your listening. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I think that is a, a fascinating topic uh, for us all to hear about, and very much the need of the hour. We all work, most of us are working in uh, large schools, and those schools are inevitably extremely noisy, noisy places and sometimes quite distracting places to work, both for teachers and for students. So uh, uh, an excellent topic, and, and many thanks. Um, my, my belief is that uh, one of the reasons for coming to a conference is, is networking, and another reason for coming is sharing. And uh, so I'd like to follow that principle for the remaining time that we have. Um, and I'd like to divide it into two parts, whereby in the first part, everybody in the room is talking. Slightly risky thing, possibly a slightly innovative thing, and it reminds me slightly of a situation where a classroom is very uh, teacher-centered, where a lecture is being given, uh, students are taking notes, uh, they go back, uh, learn it up, mug it up for homework, there's a test the following day, and many of us are trying to move away from that to a more child-centric classroom where students are possibly working in pairs or in groups um, one of the fears is that the noise levels rise, um, which could often be confused with poor classroom management. Um, but I'd like to have a, not a noisy ballroom, but a, a buzzy ballroom in a moment. And I'd like you all, all of you, to think of an example of successful innovation in the institution where you currently work or where you have recently worked. Uh, innovation that was embraced by colleagues. It doesn't, at this point, it doesn't have to be connected to the classroom. Uh, we have talked a lot about technology, but I'd like you to consider other forms of innovation. Some of you are not working in schools, so we could also consider new ways of doing things, new ways of communicating, for example. And earlier this morning, we had a uh, somebody who was talking about uh, sports, and I think the brand name was Ready Steady Go. And when I say Ready Steady Go, I would like you to turn to the person beside you and share that example of successful innovation. We haven't quite reached that point yet. The second part will be sharing best practice and the uh, people who are sitting at the circular tables, who I think have prepared uh, points to make at this session, uh, I will invite them to make their points, and then we'll build on those points, share them, see where it goes, and hopefully we'll end roughly at the correct time. I know that some of us have got flights to catch. Okay, so um, the task, fairly simple and fairly straightforward. It only works if you have a partner. So if you're sitting by yourself, or if you're rather far away from another person, would you kindly move? And the task is simply to share an example of successful innovation in the institution where you work. Because there is lots of good innovation taking place 
all over the place. And we're at a conference where we're going to share some of those great ideas. OK? So, ready, steady, go. Okay, everybody, thank you very much. It's, it's very tempting from the moderator's point of view just to let that carry on. That, that would make my life very relaxing. Ladies and gentlemen, can I stop you? Uh, we're starting the discussion again.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, can we have your kind attention, please? Thank you, Salim. I want everybody's attention here, please. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay. So now we'd like to hear some of these uh, great things that have been happening in your institutions. Just a few examples, please, of, of uh, what happened and, and why you think it was good. But instead of talking about your own example, I'd, I'd like you to talk about the other person's example. So if the lady or gentleman speaking to you was talking about something really interesting that grabbed your attention, you thought it was really good, would you please raise your hand and, and Salil will give you the microphone. Yes, we'd like to start at the back, so thank you. There's a gentleman there in a purple shirt. What happened and why do you think it was good? Okay, uh, the, the person I'm sitting next to is very shy and doesn't want to speak on his own. Okay. Uh, hello, my name's John and I, I'll, I'll be talking to you a little bit later anyway. Um, uh, my uh, partner here, whose name is? Kanish. Kanish. Kanish gave a very, very, very uh, interesting example of innovation in, at the preschool level, and I couldn't quite believe it when he first told me about it. It was that innovative. He, in his schools, teaches ethics and values to children as young as two years old. Thank you, John. Excellent. OK, and uh, there was a gentleman behind you, Salil. Uh, yes, father, I think. Right. Father Kenneth Miskita, yeah. but I want to talk to, about Mr. Carl Laurie and his uh, experiment and innovation in having children of the school mentored. Mentoring children is very important, and it's very difficult in our context when there are 40, sometimes more than 40 children in a classroom. So for one subject teacher, class teacher, to mentor so many becomes very difficult. Mentoring means spending at least five to 10 minutes with the child, say once in two weeks or once a month at least. So what he devised was a methodology by which he could get several teachers involved in one particular classroom. So that instead of one teacher looking after 40, maybe you'd have four teachers looking after the 40. So the subject teachers are involved in mentoring also, not only the class teachers. And then besides the subject teachers, also he has the clerks, the, the laboratory assistants, and all the others in the school mentor somebody or the other. So each will get a group of nine to 10 students only. They can do this mentoring during the short break, lunch break, after school, or whatever time. Mm -hmm. But they give individual attention, and so they can sort out problems of children, and also it helps for developing relationships, bonding, which are, is extremely important in school, even Fantastic. to deal with discipline problems. Going all the way through the school? R from, uh, from the fifth to the ninth, from that's the what is. OK, thank doing. you. Great, super. Great. Uh, another example here, yes, lady with the, oh. Okay, this is uh, regarding you know, this friend of mine re whose field is nutritious diet. As we all know, all our children today, they are, you know, going to fast food. So to take them away and provide, you know, the same kind of food, but in a nutritious way, what he has done in his company is that instead of deep frying the French fries, he is getting them baked and then spraying with the minimal oil to give it shape and it tastes and looks like exactly the French fries. So Super. I think that's a great innovation. Super, great. So we've got an example of ethics, mentoring, nutrition. Uh, Salil, there was a lady right behind you there. Yeah. And then somebody from over there. Uh, I was having a talk with my friend Rakhi from Nagpur. Uh, what they've implemented in their preschool is that since they found that the children were bored sitting for continuously three to four hours at the same position, uh, they formed certain hubs, oral hub, written hub, maths hub, and they circulated uh, the timetable in such a way that each section goes at a particular time to the hub. As a result, the children have a break. They don't have to sit continuously for a long period of time. Their interest is generated. Plus, the teacher concentrates on one hub and developing that hub. For example, she's looking after maths hub. So she's concentrating on developing activities in her maths hub. And therefore, all the, the children go to all the hubs uh, in rotation. And that's how the children also uh, uh, get encouraged. And the teacher also has time for more innovation in her hub. Fantastic. Thank you. So that's a really good pedagogic example of, of innovation. OK, we have another taker over there. Any hands on that side of the hall? There's one here, right. 
Okay, sorry, thank you. Uh, so far, uh, the, the, I feel that uh, values are caught, not taught. And we have been practicing this in our school. And every week, we have been spending more than one hour self-assessing and so that the values are caught by the students. Our effort was that whatever uh, toxic thought we had within ourselves, we admitted, even the principal, I, I started with myself, <coughs> right? From toxic thought, negative thought, waste thought, we tried to get rid of these type of thoughts and try to go towards necessary thoughts, right thoughts, positive thoughts and elevated thoughts. This has Sorry. been what we have been trying. And sometimes people comment that principal can't get a chair. Right? This is a normal comment. Whenever any person, whenever any teacher put up any point regarding anybody or whatever it is, I try to put for three filter tests. Thank you very much. The three, three, just a minute. Oh. Three filter tests. I ask whether the information that you are going to give me is true, whether it is good, whether it is useful. If it passes any of these filters, you can pass on the information to me. Otherwise, there's no use. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. OK, and there was a lady over there, yes, sitting at the end, wearing a white. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have got two innovations, exactly. Um, if I give my introduction, it's like uh, he's my father. He's the founder of ODM Education Group. I'm just accompanying him over here. And uh, I'm currently a student in Bachelor of Architecture in Kitty University. So I wanted to say that the two innovations what my father's school has actually got. Uh, first innovation is from last 25 years. We are, we, are, we are working on human excellence. And we have got certain peer specified period on value education from grade one to standard 12 people. We teach them what is human etiquette, all the human values. And for that only, we have got a good recognition in our state. And we are the only and only school who follows this in our state. And second, second innovation is the last year, we got a national recognition for we, we made our shoe. It's like walk a mile and charger instruments, laptop, phone, iPads, everything. It's like uh, through a shoe, when you walk, it will get charged. And um, we won even national awards. We made this Apij Abdul Kalam for this uh, innovation, and that's the thing. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing that. OK, any other urgent hands waving at me? Yes, maybe the last, the last hand for part one here in the middle. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, when we talk about innovation uh, and uh, uh, we want to give first-hand information to our children. What we are doing is we take our children for nature walk. My teachers of uh, various subjects, they're taking children, uh, junior children till class five for the nature walk, and then they are teaching them in, outside in the fields and the, uh, you know, uh, nearby areas, uh, whether it's a EVS or English or maths. And maths also my children are studying outside the classrooms only. You know? Okay, thank uh, you very much. That is what uh, we are doing it. Okay, so that, that, that gives us a, an idea of the range of innovation taking place at our schools here in India. And it's a, it's a fantastic range of brilliant ideas. But how do we make it happen? The theme of today's, uh, of this afternoon's session is culti cultivating innovation in school education. Cultivating it, to my mind, means how do we make it happen? How do we create a climate to make it happen? Because I, I think uh, sometimes innovation is quite, quite a simple thing. Um, particularly, and I don't mean this negatively, where technology is concerned. Uh, a decision is made to introduce new technology into the school, and then it is a matter of setting out your plan and, and your training and briefing and um, getting people on board is not so difficult because uh, technology is exciting. It's fun. Everybody wants to do it. But I think many of us, going back to the point I made earlier, are thinking about teachers in a regular classroom who come back year after year and do the same thing. 
How do we encourage those teachers to take on new challenges, to embrace new ideas, to do things differently? How do we create a climate whereby teachers are being encouraged to innovate? Or do we force them to innovate? Do we appraise their performance at the end of the year on the extent to which they have innovated? Do we make it mandatory or do we simply make it a good thing, things that are something that we wish to encourage? So I'd now like to move into part two where I, I would like to invite uh, speakers from the tables at the front to share their thoughts on um, the best practices of innovation. How do we get teachers innovating in our schools? How do we get them coming back, doing things differently, experimenting without the fear of somebody saying, hmm, that was a disaster, that went wrong? How do we mitigate risk, support, and encourage? So who would like to get the ball rolling? Yeah. Oh, there are several hands going up already. Yes. Thank you, Celia. I'm Shikha Banerjee. Principal Seth Anandram Jaipuriya School in Kanpur. When I talk about innovation, I'm reminded about a commercial ad that comes. Children playing football. The football is kicked in a way. It goes to a balcony of a person. And that person does not want to return the football. They open their shirts and make a football out of those t-shirts and start playing. <laughs> right? I think this is the very elementary form of an innovation. So the, when we talk about innovation, human, any human being probably has it in them, the tendency to innovate. And for that purpose, we can utilize the enthusiasm of the children, kindle their will to learn, and should be a very gradual process. Anything abrupt, I think, will not work well. Mandatory, of course not. And it has to be the willingness of the teacher. Okay. The teaching should decrease, the learning should increase. And teaching and learning are not the same. Teaching is by the teacher, learning is by the student. Thank you. So you, you picked up on the point I made about making it mandatory. You, you said it's in us. We are all innovative. We are all creative. Let it come out naturally. But what happens if it doesn't come out naturally? What happens if you do find teachers coming back and repeating the same classes in the same way? Um, yes, ma'am. And, and feel, feel free to make a, a completely different point if you would like to do so. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Yasmin Contractor, Principal Summerfield School, Gurgaon. Here, we have been talking about cultivating uh, innovation in school education. And I feel something, somebody that is most important in taking this forward is the principal of a school. Role of a principal and what steps she can take to better education, innovation in leadership is what I would like to talk about. Because a principal should be the innovation in chief, in charge of it all. She should uh, not, it's not that she's the only one who thinks about innovation, but when an idea has come through, she should not just delegate the responsibility. It is for her to take it on and move along with her team and take it, go right deep into it. And any innovation that hap happens should be an active innovation. It should be a visible innovation. Wherever, when, when you are innovating something, talk about it. Talk to parents, talk to stakeholders, talk to your children during the assemblies, talk in faculty meetings, talk to social media if it's required, because good, good innovations need to inspire people and they need to be shared and not to be kept to yourself. So the more sharing you do, the better it is. Then another thing is that make innovation an explicit core value of your school and ensure that you get adequate time for it. Unless you plan, you think, you, you know, unless uh, you keep that time away for innovation and that really helps. And very important, give space to innovate. Give space to your teachers to innovate. Let them be risk takers. Failures may happen, it's all right. You learn from the failures and move ahead. But that responsibility, that innovation should happen. When you are hiring people, be cautious about it. 
Sometimes when you, you know, a person may seem really good, but if in depth, if you see if the person has lacks creativity, you will be have, hiring a lot of people who are not creative or not innovative. As a result, you know, the balance will not be there. And if you have like-minded people doing innovation, creativity, your school is going to flourish. Then, of course, uh, there should be a lot of uh, informal processes of knowledge exchange. You can go to schools which are close to your school, see what is the best practice happening there. If, you know, if in technology is being integrated there, find what is good for them. What is, I think, this, these need to be shared. And if, you know, if you can swap teachers and say, okay, my teachers will go to your school for three, four hours or three, four days, and your teacher can come to mine if you have that sort of a relationship with a neighborhood school, it really works well because then you understand how things are moving. And then, of course, very important in any innovation is ask why. If a thing is said, okay, I want to put my smart class there, why? So it's not enough that you say one why. One why would entail only one answer, okay, it's an intelligent, it's a good way to do it, everybody is doing it. But you ask why five times, you'll get five different answers and a holistic view of why that innovation needs to be done. Then another, as uh, he was talking about, is self-evaluation. I'll finish it. Yeah, I've, got, I've got a few more okay. people, but right. you're so doing... This is what... I'll stop at that, and I will just talk about just two many small diverse fields. The result is an empowered, flexible organization. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, some really, really crucial points there, and I think the one that I would pick out would be celebrating innovation, talking about it, um, calling staff together, calling students together, and making a big deal out of it so that that encourages people. They can see that something new has happened and that you're supporting them. I think the celebration of innovation is, is a really important point. Thank you. Okay, now we've got various hands going up. There's one. Can I just have uh, this lady here and then the gentleman there? And then I'll come to you. Good afternoon. I'm Jeannie Aibara. So what I understood of your question was that what are we doing to ensure that our teachers are innovative? And do we grade them? Do we award them in the end? Have I got the question right? That is, yes. Yeah. In order to ensure that my teachers knew where they were standing with innovation, we've had a lot of in-house workshops. And where teachers have gone for professional development, they have conducted those workshops in school. But one of the very striking things which I would like to mention over here is that I'm trying to teach my entire staff to become special educators. Generally in a school what I've noticed is there is just one teacher or a small department handling that. If we can sensitize the teachers to all become special educators, I think it will be wonderful. Thank you. Working hard on this point. Another thing that you were saying, that how do we know which teacher is innovative, whether everybody is practicing it? We've devised a new teacher assessment form in which various categories have been put down, and that form is given at the beginning of the session to the teacher. So she knows what she has to work on. It's not at the end of the year I'll ask you, did you go for a workshop? How did you innovate? She grades herself on each point, a scale from zero to five, her HOD then supervises. She may bring down or raise one of the markings. And finally, it comes to me as the principal. So in that way, each teacher really does something because you have to, at the end of the year, put it down in black and white. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So there's a, an element of evaluation there. And um, I liked your point about requiring teachers to take on the responsibilities of special educators, uh, children with special needs. So you are, in a sense, obliging them to uh, go out into new territory and, and discover something new. And although I'm not going to uh, embark on a publicity stunt, the Cambridge Certificate for Teaching and Learning actually requires teachers to do something they haven't done before. And in that sense, we are making innovation mandatory. It's not an option. You're, you're not able to take out your favorite lesson plan and teach it. You have to try out something which is going to be a bit of a risk. You have to say what you're going to do, why you're going to do it, how you're going to do it. 
And then there is an evaluation and a reflection on what you have done. So making it mandatory in one sense does work. Now there was a gentleman over here. Salil, where are you? Oh, I have a microphone. So it's on. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I am Scott Leader Yudhvir Singh retired. My school is Golaya Progressive Public School Palwal. Now, coming to a reluctant teacher who is not ready to take on the new, everyone is, uh, you know, prone to continuing with the same thing, averse to the change. My suggestion is, and that's what I have done in my school, I have taken class from LKG to class 12th. Lead by example. Set your example, show you your teacher, you can do it better, or this is the better way, and she will follow you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. And if you would be kind enough to pass the microphone to your right, yes. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Aris Pawar from MDN Public School. Uh, so we have started with, like, uh, in one way, as we have been seeing students like uh, we hear they, they have become smarter than us, especially in the case of technology. So what we have done is we have, uh, you can say, got our teachers on the same level. They have been provided with uh, uh, tabs. And we have started with tab technology right from nursery class onwards. And we are heading, you can say, further. And at the same time, what I mean to say is teachers have been asked to be full on with all the latest technology and they have to submit their report how much they have come up with it just i would like to say that is don't go against the students no you should not go for it rather be with them and you also try to be uh, keep a pace with that thank you thank okay you. so you require them to submit a report so there, there is a formal aspect to it you're not just hoping that it will happen but you are actually setting up a framework to make sure that it does happen. And that, of course, makes evaluation much more uh, successful afterwards. So, ma'am, if I can give you the microphone, and then there's a gentleman behind you. Uh, so if you would be, you start. Yeah, hello. I'm Ramanjit Guman, principal in this World School, Ludhiana. Uh, as an organization, uh, innovation is one of our core values. So that's why we lay a lot of emphasis on innovation. So with regard to technology uh, we, uh, and tabs, I will not speak about it. We use it extensively. I want to speak about one practice uh, at my organization that happens across schools of all in this, and that's called IKT, In This Know Thyself. And uh, it's very important to know yourself, your strengths, and your weaknesses. So it starts with the mentor. So the mentor does the analysis that what's her strengths, what her weaknesses are. It's basically a goal setting exercise and it's done uh, right at the beginning of the session during the training sessions for the mentors and the children have a weekly session and we help the children. We have devised certain goals that are behavioral and they are academic goals but they are just guidelines. The child could pick up any goal. So there's a goal. I'll not tear paper from my pages, from my notebook, or I'll not lose my temper. That could be a behavior, or I'll, le I'll learn the tables till five, etc., etc. So children set their goals that are the monthly goals, and there's a review that happens weekly, so there is time assigned for that. So there's a self-assessment, then there's a peer assessment, or peer review, I'll call it, not assessment. The mentor reviews it, and they have uh, at different grades it changes it becomes complex as they grow in years so it could be a smiley where they color if they've just followed it half then they color it half otherwise they colored it full then the booklet goes home over the weekend then the parent reviews it and if four weeks consecutive weeks if the child can stick to the goal then the child becomes a goal champ and only and only then the child is uh, you know, have allowed to take on the next goal because often we as people just pick up goals and let them just be. So we are helping children to develop skills while they are uh, doing the reviews, a lot of skills come in and while, uh, you know, they're picking up goals at that point, review comes in and the, uh, you know, ability to take feedback and that happens right from the top level of the management to the child 
in grade one. So it starts from grade one and it ends at the top management. So every mentor has to have her form, uh, like uh, the booklet. And thank you, thank it. you very much. Very interested to hear that innovation is one of the core values of your school. We also believe that it should be one of the attributes of a successful learner. And as I said at the beginning, I think one of the purposes of coming to a conference is to share best practice, share ideas, network. So do make a note of who's speaking, and when you have your next coffee break, make a beeline for the person and find out more. Indus World School, Ludhiana. Now there's a gentleman there. Yes. Sir, teachers are getting 12 casual leave and uh, 10 earned leave. So total 22 days in a year, teachers are away from the school. And besides this, uh, the teachers are out of, uh, out of school for several other reasons. So in such case, definitely there, there will be a loss of the students. So what I do, before granting the leave of the teacher, I, I ask them to give uh, what is to be done in your absence, so that there should not be a loss of the student. So I'm taking the assignment and uh, that assignment is given to the students in their absence. Here, the benefits here we are getting that uh, we, are, we shall be able to keep the students engaged and uh, we shall be able to prevent their loss. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Excellent. Okay. Uh, now, hands are shooting up all over the place. A little just, just behind you there. Yes, lady on the end. And, and yeah, you see, I focused rather Good too heavily over everybody. there, so I compensated. Now I've gone too far the other way. I'll come back to the middle. This, uh, I'm Ritu Gupta, Indra Prastha Global School Noida, principal. Uh, one uh, very uh, good uh, innovation that uh, I've brought into the school is at an experiential level. In staff meetings, I always encourage or it's a kind of an unsaid mandatory that every staff meeting begins with at least two teachers sharing what new things they have done in their class. This is great encouragement because teachers get to share and they learn from each other and it brings in a very healthy competitive spirit into the system. And I would suggest that try it, it's going to make the teachers really vibrate with enthusiasm. Thank you. Thank you, I like that. Vibrating with enthusiasm sounds good. Yes, uh, so in the middle here, yes. The, behind you now. The microphone is coming over your right shoulder, yeah. I'm Kamal Saini. I'm director of two schools in Kabiz and Siddharth International. So being from the army, I'll come straight to two points, you know. One innovation which probably makes it necessary, as they say, necessity is the mother of invention. When I was in army, we were moved to move out of our barracks. So General Sundarji was the chief of army staff that particular time, and 17 did, which had never moved in its life. They were moved from Gangtok. So some of the detachments, they were on the limbs. So we went to see over there how are they ready for, to take on the enemy. So I had a Sikh battalion over there. So when I asked him, how long are you going to take to be ready to take on the enemy. So he replied me in Punjabi, I'll translate it for you in English. He said, what are you talking about the time, sir? I'll just take out the floor from the barrel of two-inch mortar and ready to fire. So that is the best kind of innovation. He knows it. He has to say, take care of himself for two days and also be ready for that. The second thing what Amatya Sen probably has done in West Bengal with his trust that he started giving meals to the people, the poor people, and now the parents who have been made the stakeholders of that particular scheme, they say, our children had enough of food, now please give them the education. <laughs> Thirdly, I would like to reiterate what right. ma'am said. In my school also we are doing it, that on PTM day, whatever innovation has been done by the concerned teachers are on display and to be explained to the parents. So that definitely has worked. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know how we're doing for time, uh, uh, Salil, because I've, I've got a winding up activity. Yes, we'll Should I? Up in the next like, 10, 15 minutes. 10, 15 minutes. Okay. So we've got. We don't have a presentation. 
Okay, okay. But I'm, I'm conscious that the next session was timetabled for 3.30. So um, we, we do have time for just one or two more points. If there's anybody at the front particularly who would like to speak, let's take your points now. Uh, and then we'll move over to you, sir. Good evening. I'm Neelam Gandhi from DAV Public School Sector 37, Faridabad. Uh, when we talk about uh, the innovation, so I have tried to build a climate uh, which, uh, which uh, brings in more innovations with the help of my parents. I, have, uh, I invite my parents to give their ideas and uh, particularly in the nursery section, what I have done is whenever there is a festival, because there is a diverse section of uh, uh, people coming from uh, um, other religions or the regions, so they come in, uh, like it, if it is Guru Nanak Jayanti, I ask the Sikh parents to uh, dress up and, and the children also in the same way and they, uh, they sing Guru Bani in the, uh, in the morning assembly. So, uh, same way with other festivals also. Then I have taken help from my parents, those who are engineers. One of my parents is an electrical engineer and his brother an electronics engineer. And we have dealt with Tara Mandal in our school. That is a planetarium, a small pa a mini planetarium where we show the stars, the stars, the solar system, and uh, the moon on uh, the man on moon, and like this. So it's a it's a small, but it's a very nice innovative thing. And with the help of the parents, in the same way, I uh, tell my parents that on Holi, supposing there are people from Bihar or Uttar Pradesh, so they they cook, they bring uh, those uh, gujiyas. So it is it's just like that. And then I have um, uh, I have started. I have given names to my children that the blue saviors, the blue saviors, the green saviors, and the hawks. The blue saviors. In each class, we have blue saviors, and uh, they are responsible to see that there is no water wastage in the uh, bathrooms or the toilets or wherever they go, the drinking water. And the green soldiers, they see that all the electricity, all the bulbs, all the fans are put off before they leave the class. And the hawks, they uh, have a, a, ma a headgear. They wear during the uh, recess period, during the lunch period, and uh, whenever, and they are silent. They are silent only. What they do is, if somebody throws any packet or any anything down, like a hawk, they just uh, uh, like they pick it up and uh, run away to put in the dustbin so that the other the, the student, those who, the one who has thrown it, understands for life that they should not do like this. So there are many other things. One another thing is honesty bite. Again, this is all honesty bite. Again, this is with the help of the parents. I have in, I have had questioned my parent that one parent uh, uh, in each corridor is sitting there. And uh, we have some small packets, like uh, uh, the dry things, like chips or toffees or candies or uh, whatever it is. And the students, the, nothing has to be done. The teacher doesn't do anything. The parent doesn't do anything. There is one, stu there is one parent sitting, sorry. And uh, the children give money. And then there are packets on the rack. They themselves, little far, little far from the place. They, if they have given five rupees, they will pick up the five rupee. Uh, it is written on there, and it is that they don't because they will be tempted to pick up the thing which cost more or which is more lucrative, like a chocolate. Also, they can pick, but they are allowed to put the money there and themselves go and pick up the packet that they have paid for. So that is a good habit that they learn from the very beginning that they have to be honest with what they have to they have paid. They have to pick up the same thing. Thank you. A, a very innovative use of um, parents, I think, is the involvement of parents in schools is a very important aspect that we haven't touched on either today or, or yesterday, as far as I know. Yes, the, the lady here. Uh, Mrs. Das from St. John's in Chandigarh. And ours is a mission school. So for us, a very important part of education is reaching out beyond your school and moving out into the community and we call it the Community Outreach Program. Now making that possible during the school hours and allowing your children to get interactive with the community is a challenge in itself and that's where the innovation came in. But I think innovation needs to be brought about by allowing your children and your staff to be able to work out the logistics of something for themselves but being at the same time supportive of everything they're doing so that they know that yes, what I'm doing is possible and we'll make it possible. So that's the way we did it, and we did manage to arrange it such that every week, once a week, each class will pick up for the year a particular project. For example, they might be working with the School for the Blind, they might be working with children in the thalassemic areas or the PGI, anywhere. 
They will choose their project. They will work with those people. 20 kids, just five from each class will go out and they will interact with that group which they have work, chosen to work with. So it works both ways. The children get enriched in interacting with, these, with, with the less fortunate people. They are enriched by seeing the children. And then we tell them, you have to figure out what they need. And once you figure out what they need, you can't reach into your parents' pockets. You have to generate the funds yourself. So now children are working on schemes. They're working on canteens. They're doing all sorts of things. And they're learning the value of contributing through hard work. And at the end of it, when they finally are able to meet the needs of the group which they're working with, they're able to understand that there's a lot out there in society, a lot of people who need help. And if we vary it every year, then the variety gets widened. And for the junior classes, we do things like move out not only into the community of people, but animals. So we even have the babies who are adopting animals in the zoo. They've gone on board on the tiger thing by adopting a, the new tiger which was born this year. So they've picked up the baby and they've adopted it. And these little things allow them to see that if we are to live as a community, if we are to grow into this world, then we have to reach beyond our schools and move outwards. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. A very in innovative idea. And so, if I may give you the microphone. Thank you, sir. Myself, Dr. Meena Ketan, Principal ODM Public School. Okay. They hear that, uh, you know his son, my uh, point to speak here, that every child should be allowed for the uh, place for the innovation. Because it's my experiment, what I have done, just I'm sharing. So we had made one club that is called Disaster Management Club. During this filing in Odisha, just we had been to it, uh, that is a remote village where there was not two months, there was no electricity. But just we had been to there after seven days. Just we stayed for three days without electricity and without uh, that just we are making the cooking food for the people, those who are the homeless people. But uh, that my students, they could manage everything, but they could not manage themselves without a mobile. So they, are, they became much more worried. Sir, what to do? There is no mobile, there is no mobile, no laptop. So, okay. so just I told you do one thing. So you please find out the way how you can manage your mobile without electricity. That just after two months, one child came that he invented that is what a my charger mobile. And that project has been awarded by APJ Abdul Kalam, what my daughter was saying. So this is uh, the project and they have done. And it is uh, without electricity, just to, that is a shoe they have, a pijo that is one cell, they have uh, made it. And if you walk a mile, you can charge with the five to ten mobiles that is at a time. So that is the innovation. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody's worst nightmare, a mobile without charge. Um, now, I've, I've been asked to wind up, so uh, I'd like to go back to where we were at the beginning. Uh, we, we've had lots of ideas, innovative ideas, and we've shared those. We've also looked at ways of cultivating innovation in schools, and, and thank you very much for all of your contributions. And to finish with, I, I would like you to discuss again with the person sitting next to you how innovative you think you are. A little bit of self-evaluation on a scale of one to 10, where one is not innovative at all, and 10 is extremely in innovative. Where are you? Or, if you don't like that question, you could also answer, where is your school? Is your school one, five? or 10. So I'd like you to share that with your partner just for two or three minutes and I'd also like you to say whether you are happy with your number and what you're going to do about it if you are not happy. So please rate yourselves very quickly, informally, with your partner. Give yourself a, a 10 or a 5 or an 8. And what are you going to do about it?
Okay, super. Thanks, thanks. We'll just see if anybody gave themselves a tip. Okay, thank you. Uh, did anybody give themselves a 10? Oh, who gave themselves a 9? You're so modest. Well, you were a 9, right? Were there any 8s? 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And who didn't give themselves any number at all? <laughs> OK, that brings us to the end of the session. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for that wonderful session. And it was very interactive. Thank you, William, for that wonderful session on cultivating innovation in school education. Now, uh, as you know, you've been doing this drill from the past two days now. We'll be again doing it. So I'll be reading out the names. And William, I would request you to please go ahead and give these uh, certificates to all the people who will be coming up on the stage. Uh, first will be Naresh Dubey, DGM Training and FMD Armstrong. Let's give him a round of applause, please, gentlemen. It will be Colonel Dr. K. S. Sahani, Principal St. Kabir School, Hisar. Let's give him a round of applause, everyone. <laughs> Mrs. Uttara Singh, Principal of Sri Ram Millennium School, Noida. Ms. Rachna Panth, Principal Ramja School, R.K. Puram, New Delhi. Ms. Anju Dagar, Principal Bansi Vidyaniketan, Sri Senior Secondary School, Balabgarh. I think there's somebody else to take the word from her? No. Okay. Uh, Vikesh Beniwal, Director, Bansi Vidyaniketan, Senior Secondary School, Balabgarh. J. Ajit Past Jain, Senior Principal, Bharti Vidya Bhavan. Rajaji Vidya from Chennai. Then we have Anita Vadera, Principal Darbari Lal DAV School, Model School, New Delhi. We have Kavita C. Das, Principal St. John's High School, Chandigarh. St. John's, yeah. There are a few people who have already left for the, because they were late for the flights. Uh, one of them is Farzana Shakil Ali, Principal City International School, Lucknow. So she has already left her and taken her certificate. Uh, then there was Indu Ketripal, Principal Salun Public School, New Delhi. Uh, Jenin N. Arbia, Principal Ambient School, New Delhi. Jaya. No. Jenny. We have Jaya Badwaj, Principal Hans Raj Public School, Panchkula. Ramjit Guman, Principal Indus World School, Ludhiana. Let's give him a round of applause, everybody, please. We're going to need this round of applause later by the award function, so this slow sound cannot work. So let's give him a bigger round of applause. Yeah, that's more likely. Thank you. And uh, we have somebody from Ludhiana. Okay. We have Ms. Anradha Gupta, Principal, the Sri Ram Millennium School, Faridabad. We have Yasin Contractor, Principal, Summerfield School, Gurgaon. Let's give them a big round of applause, please, gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Give them space to walk. 
We have Mr. Ritu Gupta, Principal Indraprasth Global School, Noida. I think there is someone else to. You have come on behalf of Mr. Ritu Gupta, right? Ramit Kaur. So Ramit Kaur will be taking the award for the Noida School. Mr. Rajkumar Sharma, Principal Satyuk Darshan Vidyalaya, Greater Faridabad. Mr. J.C. Chawla, Principal Dayawati Modi Public School, Ghaziabad. Mr. R.S. Panwar, Principal MDN Public School, Rothak. And there will be Dr. Neera Sharma. She is principal DAV Public School, Amritsar. Please give her a round of applause. That's okay. Uh, there's someone else to take it on uh, her behalf. Mr. Yudhir Singh, Director, Goela Progressive Public School, Palwal. Please give him a round of applause, everyone. And there is Mr. Willie Board George, Principal St. Willie Board High School, Mumbai. Jai Shri M. Tripathi, International Education, Educator and Advisor, Global Education Programs. That's okay. <laughs> Still we're on the session, right? And our award goes to Sh Mrs. Shikha Banerjee, Principal Seth Anandram Jaipuria School, Kanpur. I would request uh, Naresh Dubla, DGM Training and FMD Armstrong to please be on stage and give this uh, token of appreciation for our session chair, William, Regional Director, South Asia at Cambridge International Examination. Please give a big round of applause for William here. We have one more uh, certificate to give away. I think the gentleman is here. It's Mr. Anirudh Gupta, CEO, DCM Group of Schools, Ferozpur. See ya? I would please request all the uh, certificate takers and everybody in the speaker session, please come on the stage for a group photograph. William, just be there for a group photograph for a minute. I know you have a flight to catch, but still, just a minute here. Yeah? And uh, please, everybody, come quickly. William has a flight to catch, very fast. Let's just ramp it up. Please be seated. Are you, uh, John? Take your certificates. Take your
उनको स्माइल तो बोल दो सुनल I would request everybody to please submit their uh, forms which have been given, and uh, please submit it to the registration desk while you go, while you're going. And I uh, would request you to be here because we will be conducting another session. But if anybody is leaving, please submit your forms at the registration desk. It's very very important for us to know that you know how do you feel in the session. Please do that. Thank you.